uh, it's a joint work with Eric Fusen, by the way. So I talk about Tana uh, uh, bicolor maps. So I remind you what is a Tana map, and actually I consider Wooty Tana map. So Tana map, as you know, is the graph embedded on the sphere. It's rooted, meaning that it has a marked oriented edge. Okay, and if so, it has a canonical drawing in the plane by choosing as an external face in the plane the face, say, on the right <coughs> of the on the right of the root edge. So that's the my, my map of the sphere that is kind of wrapping on the plane. The plane. And we consider bicolor maps, which are maps which are bicolor <coughs> in black and white. Okay, this means that the vertices of color in black and white in such a way that it enables of different colors. And uh, they can be black rooted if the origin of the wood edge is black or white rooted. Okay, and uh, of course, a uh, condition for the map, uh, uh, as you know, for, because it's a planar map, there are a sufficient condition, a necessary sufficient condition for the map to have such a bicoloration is that it's, uh, all its faces are even. Yesterday, in uh, Jean Bernard's talk, in uh, you all Okay. And uh, I say that the map has a boundary of next 2m if the degree of the external face in purple is uh, 2m, or is 6. And I will call mm, ballet, say, the set of uh, the ballet, because it's black rooted, the set of black rooted bicolor maps at the boundary of next 2m. Okay. My bivariate generated function, what, 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 what it is, I'm going to be generated functions, several, several of them, but they all get the same weightings, which is the weight T black per black vertex and T white per white vertex. So that's a new thing. Usually you don't distinguish between black and white. Okay, and then there is standard control on the degree of the phase spaces, with putting a degree GK per phase of degree 2K. So it's not bivariate, it's multivariate. But uh, the, new, the new ingredient is that I put this two to, to distinguish between black and white vertices. So in particular, if the degree of the faces of all the inner faces is, uh, is fixed, say four, then it's really bivariate because uh, you don't have to put away to the faces in that case. Okay, so uh, let me consider, for instance, the first generating function, Fn, which is a sum of maps in Mn of the weight W, which is T black to the black vertices, T white to the white vertices, and the product of the whole inner faces uh, of the corresponding G, right? So here, just two, two, uh, two remarks. By convention, I put no weight to the external uh, face. And also, I put no weight to the root vertex. So that's why I divide it here by one of the people. So the it's a full generating function if you want. It's not Fn, but it's a sum over n of g n f n times t black. <coughs> That's all black that rooted maps. Okay. The two point function, I remind you, it's a distance dependent two point function. That's the difficulty is because it's distance dependent. So it's now has to do with pointed black rooted maps. So it's a map which is both black rooted and which has an extra map vertex of arbitrary black or white color. And I call G of D the generating function of these maps, pointed black rooted maps, with the black extremity of the root edge, that is as the root vertex, is at distance D from the pointed vertex, and the other is at distance, the other one is at distance D minus one. Could be D plus one, but I choose D minus one. Okay, that's my definition. Okay. And that's the object I have. Uh, I eventually want to, uh, to, to compute. So as uh, some of you know already, there is a direct connection between these two generating functions, g of d, which depends on the distance, and f of n, which where well, there is no distance, but there is the length of the, the perimeter of the external phase. So how does this, uh, I mean, where, where does this connection come from? So start with a black rooted uh, Cartesian black rooted map with a boundary of x to n here drawn in the plane, and I will enlarge my set of uh, maps from n n to a slightly larger set, which is uh, sorry the set of maps which are 
po pointed, so that was uh, which were routed, so, so that was M N, and pointed, but with constraints on the distance. Okay, so if I call D ballet, yeah, if D ballet the distance from the root vertex to the pointed vertex, I will impose that D ballet is less than D. And also I will impose that all the boundary vertices are at the distance larger than D ballet from the pointed vertex. Meaning that this is one of the closest points to the pointed vertex among all the points on the boundary. So that's what I call M N of D. And of course, and I call F N of D the corresponding uh, the corresponding uh, generating function, with now the convention that it's this point gets no weight. <coughs> so I just divide by <coughs> corresponding t, which depends on that, can be white or black. Okay, so sure. And of course, uh, for d equals 0, the distance between the pointed vertex and the root vertex is 0, it means that the two vertices are the same. In this case, uh, this con condition is automatic, and therefore mn is nothing but mn of 0. Okay. So this uh, Fn of D can be obtained by a slice decomposition. You take a map if M in Mn of D, and for each vertex on the boundary, you draw its leftmost shortest path along in the map to the uh, pointed vertex. There are several shortest paths, and you take the leftmost one. And you do that for all the boundary vertices. And what you end up with is something like that. So now if I label the boundary vertices by their distance to the point vertex, not exactly the distance, but the distance shifted by d minus d ballet, so that this, this vertex, the whole vertex, gets the label d. Okay. Then the set of distances around the face for the paths from height d I D made of plus or minus one steps, so I minus one to I or I to one minus one. Okay, and which remains about I D because that was one of the closest uh, points to the pointed vertex. And for each sequence I minus one I <coughs> like this one, okay, the leftmost geodesic path actually from this point follows the it's on the left. You can see it's on the left because you okay you're upside down. So the leftmost actually follows the uh, Follows the boundary, so it doesn't create any uh, new domain. While if you have an i followed by an i minus one, there is a creation of a new domain. So within the domain, I call an i slice. So I will describe precisely what an i slice is. But now, if you cut along this uh, uh, this path, what you end up with is first of all, there is a path itself, the path of the labels along the the boundary, so it makes a pass here like this. Okay, so the pass here, the distance is the distance from the point in vertex, which is here. So the distance is measured this way. Okay, so if you want to really see the pass, like, uh, I mean, this label is like height, you must make a flip of the pass. So the correct pass is this, which is a flip with respect to this one. And then there is a slice attached to each descending step. So it's a descending step here. Okay, so I take this pass and to each descending step, here I, I minus one, there is a slice attached. Okay. And uh, now if you re-glue, you can you go here, cut it, but you can re-glue, and if you re-glue, you realize that uh, because uh, uh, if you take a slice, say you take a slice, if the length of its boundary, left boundary here, left side is L, here you have a, a height which is n minus i minus d, because here is i minus d, this uh, distance here. And therefore, when you <coughs> hold the objects, what you get up, what you get in the end, sorry, it's, the, it's, a, it's a map where the distance, the actual distance, d black, is the maximum of all slices of l minus i minus d. So demanding that d black is less than d is equivalent to demand that in each slice, l is less than r. So, so to uh, summarize, <coughs> the slice is the map. So the map is inside. There is nothing outside. The map is inside. So it's a map with uh, 
boundary made of three parts, an edge here, which can serve as root for the, for the slice. Okay, here, a boundary of length L, with for any, some L between 1 and I. Here, we have a length L minus 1. Okay, here, this point I call the apex. Okay. And this, this, this left boundary is the geodesic path by construction. And this one is the unique geodesic path because it's a unique because I chose the leftmost uh, geodesic before. Okay. okay. So that's the definition of ice slice. Of course, I have black rooted ice slices and white rooted ice slices. And I simply note that i is only an upper bound on the, on the length of this boundary. So I call bi it's a generating function for these slices. Okay. So I put the same weights as before, t black, t white, etc. Their faces, <coughs> so which get their weight, gk. But for proper counting of the map, I should put no weights on the left boundary because upon gluing, uh, each vertex is part of the boundary is part of both at the left and the right boundary. So I decided to put weights, sorry, to put weights only on the left boundary. <coughs> if you do so for all slices, you realize that all the, 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 the points get the correct weight, and including this, this vertex, which gets no weights at all. <coughs> okay, so that's what you should do. And uh, to get uh, this bi, you can write down uh, uh, the slice, the composition of the slice itself. So a slice, say a black rooted slice, slice it's can, it can be either reduced to a single edge. <coughs> this, uh, the generic case, in which case it's counted by T black. Or it can be, if not, you look at the face on the left of the root edge, and then it's going to uh, give you a path from I, I to I, I minus 1, and you apply the same rule toward the left most of this path, now to the apex. Okay, and if you do that, you get this relation. So what is it? Z I, I minus 1. Say i i minus one is simply the generating function for the path of length two k minus one. If, it, if the length the total length is two k, the length of this part is two k minus one. From a black vertex to a white vertex, from i i to i i minus one, and I put I should put a weight v j for each descending step j j minus one, starting at the black vertex and w j for the same thing starting at the white vertex. So this is a nonlinear system of equation which we may possibly solve. So actually, uh, it's two, if, if you look carefully, if you two independent systems, one relating to W i with all <coughs> the and behind with i and one and relating the other parities, and uh, we will try to solve them. But the question is we don't know how to solve them in general. Okay, we can get some of these solutions in four particular cases, but we don't know how to solve them in general, but I will give you the solution anyway. So, uh, uh, so by the way, in this, if you take this uh, if you take this equation and you can send i to infinity, so it's going to describe slices whose left boundary uh, for which there is no bound on the left boundary. I is just a bound on the, on the left of the left boundary. So I will call B the limit of Bi when I goes to infinity. And this expression has a limit when I goes to infinity also, because you simply have to shift all the past i's by i, it is considered, then we consider a pass from 0 to minus 1, provided you, have, you attach weights Bj plus i instead of Bj, etc. So all these weights tend to their limits B and W. So in the end, what you end up is a, a closed system for B and W. So again, B and W are the slice generating function for black rooted or white rooted slices with no bond whatsoever on the left border, on the length of the left border. So they are related by this system of equation. And here, what I call double Z, okay, with this double bar here, is simply a Z which now in one homogeneous way, which are independent of the height of the pass. Okay. Uh, simply they depend on whether you start with a black vertex or with a white vertex. Okay. So now let's go back to Fn uh, uh, which was uh, one of the two objects we wanted to compute. So Fn ballet, 
So from the size decomposition, I remind you that f and t is simply a sum of a pass from id to id, which remain above id. So that was my my that was my label around the, the face uh, of uh, paths which are weighted by bj for each descending a step jj minus one, starting from the black vertex and doubling r if it start from uh, a white vertex at i i. Okay, so in particular, fn, but that is fn of zero, so it's the same thing but for pass from zero to zero. And this you can summarize in one formula, that's quite known, that's easy to, to show. That's if now I take the generative function of this fn, sum of n fn z to the n, it's a continued fraction, one over one minus <coughs> w one minus b two, etc. So note that in fn bullet, I I get only uh, the wi with odd i and the bi with even i. If I want the other ones, I should look at the fn. See, I told me it's a uh, mass control, but I simply have to change the colors black and white. For me. So now it's known that uh, if you know, if you have this formula, these coefficients can be related to these coefficients. Okay, so if you want, the size generating functions can be obtained from the fn. So I'm not going to compute fn. Actually, I'm going to use the formula which I know for fn to compute the size generating function. Okay. So it's a standard result from continued fraction theory here of the teacher's mind that the coefficients of the continued fraction are, can be related by this by ratios here of h0 or h1, hi0 or hi1 which are the uncle determinants of this type, which are determinants whose matrix elements are the Fn here. You know, so Fn plus n in one case, and Fn plus n plus 1 in the other case, the size of the matrix in I. So, go, here I compute one parity and compute the other parity as simply as you change the color. So now let's go back to the two-point function. So the two-point function, now if I take a slice, give you a slice, this slice now, okay, but an I side to this size could be in step five. Okay? And if I do the left boundary to the right boundary this way, the left boundary is a little bit larger than the right boundary, so I make this connection too. What I end in, I wrap this on the sphere, what I end up with is a rooted pointed map. And this uh, this boundary, this uh, green boundary is just the leftmost uh, geodesic pass from this point to this point. So there is no information in this can remove it and retrieve it uh, if I want. So I can basically what it's it's in the end simply a pointed rooted map with distance less than d and that's exactly what I call G of L. Uh, except that there is no I forgot the, the, the way to uh, the other point is that so if you want B of D is this uh, T black which corresponds to a single edge plus the sum over L or G of T black of L divided by the weight of this uh, of the quantity vertex which is missing in this, uh, on this side. Or in other words, g of d is equal to b of d, d, b, d minus b, d minus 1 <coughs> times t, the color of the uh, the quantity vertex, which is black, d is even, or white is d, so it's completely explicit. So the recipe is to take a known formula for fn, compute the determinants, get formulas for b and w. That's what we are going to do. Uh, so, uh, first I wanted to show you this formula, which is not important, but uh, yeah, I forget that time. So it's known, I mean, you, you can compute Fn in terms of P and W. So a formula for Fn in terms of Pi, which is a continuous fraction. But, we can get better, we can express it in terms of P and W1. And the expression is not, not a, 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 a simple generating function of pass of x to n, but it's a sum of a, it's a linear combination of generating function of pass of length to n, 2n plus 2, 2n plus 4, etc. etc. Okay, that's what I write here, so it's pass from 0 to 0, okay, which, uh, 
start from a black vertex, and at the black vertex, they remain above zero. That's not a good example. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is just to explain why there is a small hat here. I decide to, to uh, put the weights in a slightly more symmetric way. Instead of putting weights to descending steps only, I put weights to both <coughs> ascending and descending steps. But I put a square root. But there are many ascending and descending steps in these generating functions. Okay, so I do that for the some less. And so it's a linear combination with coefficients which are expressed like this, which depend on the like, etc. So they are explicit. I think the image is not explicit so far. It is L0. So what is L0? Simply uh, for n notation for a path going from i, I to i, I minus 2k. And we start with the same black vertex, black vertex like this. And with no constraint, uh, there is no plus here. Okay. So, uh, of course, it doesn't depend on i, because the weights don't depend on the, on the heights. So it's dependent of i. And it has two interesting uh, properties. First, lk is equal to l minus k. And to do that, to show that, you simply take your pass and you return it. You return it vertically this way, because if you do that, it preserves the, the weight prescription. If you do this way, you can pull it vertically over. If you, do, if, you, if you rotate this way, if you take the symmetric this way, it preserves the weights. If you take the symmetric this way, which you could do also, then the weights are not preserved. They are exchanged. So here, I return the paths vertically, and uh, therefore, I show that AK is L minus K. Here, I, I decrease by K. Here, I uh, increase by K, by 2K, the height. And also, what I can do is now make the horizontal flip. So as I told you, it doesn't <coughs> preserve the weights, but you get back the, the, the correct weights provided. Now you start from a white to white vertex. Okay, so you are allowed to make a flip like this, but then you must start from a white vertex, the white vertex to get the correct weights. And if you flip, flip once more to show that uh, now vertically, but you see that AK is also equal to a i, i minus k, but starting from the white to the white. So you can start either from the black or from the white vertex and end at the point of the same form. And now to compute the uncut determinant, so let's start with h a1, which is this determinant, with pass of length 2n plus 2m plus 2 plus 2q. Okay, if we go to this sum here. So actually, this is the simplest case. So why? Because you can decompose your pass into three parts, a part of length 2n minus 1, a part of length 2n plus 1, and a part of varying size, here it's q is varies, 2q. Okay? And this is simply this decomposition, which I write here, corresponds to a matrix. Uh, take that this matrix, actually, with the text n, n, you have the product of three matrices, 1, 2, 3, so the determinant is equal to the product of the determinants, <coughs> but these matrices are uh, triangular matrices, because if you fix this length, you cannot go too far in this direction, so they are triangular matrices, so their determinant is very easy to compute, and what you, the only difficulty comes from these determinants, the determinant of the central part, central part, which is the, uh, this, okay? So the central part, is A of K, which is the sum over AQ is uh, what I call A. Sorry. The central part is the sum of AQ is uh, A of 2Q here. So what is A? This A of 2Q here, after A to K minus 1 to A minus 1 to 2Q, is what? It's the pass going from I to K minus 1 to pass I to L minus 1. So there's a high decrease k minus l, so it's exactly what I told before, uh, l k minus l of 2q, except that there is a plus here, so I must suppress parts <coughs> which go below zero. So that's a standard trick. You use a reflection, you, use, you use, take the first, part of the first step going below zero, and this part you reflect. But now you reflect vertically, not horizontally. <coughs> because you want to preserve the weights, and you end up with a path of length of i decrease k plus 1. So 
In the end, you end up with this formula. It's going to be ck minus l, minus the determinant of ck minus l minus ck plus l, where ck is this uh, expression. OK? That's very standard. And from now on, I will assume that uh, faces have a degree of at most 2p plus 2. Okay, so, and in this case, you can easily look from the formula that a phi q is 0 for q larger than p, which means that ck equals 0 for absolute value of k larger than p. So there is a finite number of C K, these ck's here. So then it's a standard result that's a determinant of this type here. The determinant of, uh, for any ck, the determinant of this type is can be expressed in terms of the roots of the characteristic equation, which is the sum or of a whole k of ck x plus k. Okay, here the sum goes from minus p to p, so the degree is at most 2p plus 2, and it's equal to also to this term because ck is equal to c minus k, because lk was equal to l minus k. So that's my characteristic equation. It has two p solutions, which I call xa and 1 over xa. Okay, clearly it says the 1 of x to 1 over x solution. And then the determinant is equal to this expression, so a ratio of two determinants, so it's well known. Okay, but you can understand it very easily. Indeed, by looking at the kernel of this uh, this matrix, okay. Actually, let's look. Let's first look at infinite matrix C k minus L. So it's a uh, uh, null. It's the vector, vector in the kernel of this matrix, or the x a to the L, where x a or this solution of this this. Uh, Characteristic equation, okay? So this, there are the xl to the l and the xl to the minus l. One. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have this expression that's simply the characteristic equation, which tells you that. Then, if you know want to look at, uh, this is an infinite matrix, at a semi infinite matrix ck minus l minus ck plus l, and look for a vector, uh, an angle vector, it's actually. The same thing as an angle vector of ck minus l, provided, just simply by rewriting this sum, provided v minus l is minus vr. Okay, that's the <coughs> trivial identity. This is equal to this if we have this condition. Okay, so to have this condition, you take the linear combination of these two eigenvectors, and it means that if you take this, then this is zero. Okay? So it's not quite finished because here it's a semi-infinite matrix, while here actually it's, it's uh, the, the, the degree, the, the matrix is finite. So what you want is a sum up to i minus 1, and then that's very easy. Here, if k is between 1 and i, I, I plus 1, the only s which are not in the, in the correct range uh, or corresponds to vi i plus 2, vi i plus 3, and vi i plus 3 plus 1. So you simply have to make all this equal to 0. So you have p conditions, you have p vectors. So in general, uh, the, the, the view of a vector which is zero. So <coughs> you, you didn't learn anything except when this determinant is zero. So to, what it means is that when this determinant is zero, I can find a, a vector in the kernel, non-trivial kernel, in the kernel of this matrix. So this big determinant, the one I want to compute, this one is zero. When d is zero, di is zero, capital di is zero. Okay? But a capital di also cap vanishes in other cases, like when xa equals to xa prime for a different from a prime, or when xa is one over xa prime. Okay? But these are precisely the zeros of d minus one. So if I divide d a by d minus one, I recover the, 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 the So I suppress the, the, the zeros which I don't want. But it's not a proof, it's just a realistic argument. But actually, uh, there is a well-known proof of the, of the formula. Uh, yes, to obtain, of course, the, you have to obtain the proportion constant. But, so this is a easy to, not easy to prove, but it's well-known. You can find the proof in, the, for instance, in the Feldman and Harris book, in the Appendix 8, 50 or so. So in the end, that's what you end up with for HA. So for HA0, HI0, it's the uh, same thing, except, so it's, uh, you do the, play the same game, it's going to be the determinant of now, the same thing except that you have black, black here, instead of white, white. It's just, uh, that's, 
So play the same game is <coughs> LK minus L, but then the only problem is that this part, is the part you want to revert, starts with a white vertex and ends with a black vertex. Before it was starting with a white vertex and ending with a white vertex, and that's because the, the, the flow is black. So the flow breaks the black, white symmetry is black. Okay. So can, how, how do you return this path? <coughs> you can't return it horizontally because uh, vertically because it doesn't respect the color of the, the endpoints. Okay, you can return it vertically, but then, you, as you know, to get the correct weight, I must switch the colors. But still doesn't work. So it, you can't return it, uh, switch it in, in any of the ways. So what you should do is you, you must uh, stop and you must stop one step before so that you have a white, white path which you can return vertically and the last step you return vertical, uh, horizontally. So I must, and then by doing so you change the weight from B to W or from W to B depending on whether the last step was up or down. So I divide my, my path here which go below zero into smooth which end with an up step and smooth which end with a down step and this one I return this way, but I must multiply by B over W because I must reinstate, reinstate the correct way B, and this one I must multiply by W over B. <coughs> so these steps which end with an up step here, I call them delta K plus L plus 1, because the uh, I difference is 2 times <coughs> K plus L plus 1, up to Q, and this one of course is they are the complementary, so it's L K, K plus L plus 1 minus delta. So what I, this, this term which I must subtract is Bw times Lk plus L plus 1 minus delta x now, plus W over B delta x now, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the end you have this, but delta itself, with our pass which end up with an up step, you can reverse the step, so it's B over W times this, and this is Lk minus delta x, but for, any, for K plus L plus 2. So there's a close form. Close the, you can close the, and in the end, if you put everything, at this, you have infinity many reflections if you want. A to A to A, A K minus A minus, etc. Sum over A K plus A plus one, A K plus A plus two, etc. etc. With C is simply B over W, which is the square root of B over W. Okay, so it's actually it's not infinite because these these guys get zero. So it's finite, but it uh, can be very large. Okay, and the determinant you want to compute is the determinant of an object of this form now, which, which is uh, CK minus N, so it's a sum of this with the coefficients alpha Q form <coughs> of this form now. So now let me show you the heuristic argument, the same as before. So if you do the heuristic argument, you take the semi-infinite matrix and you say that you have an eigenvector, the an eigenvector of the semi-infinite matrix is actually an eigenvector of the infinite matrix K minus L, provided now it satisfies this equation. So it is satisfied this equation, this, this is equal to this quickly, which by recursion is equivalent to this condition. So that it be obvious to see what that is. So what you do is you take linear combination of your x a l a and x a l minus l, so as to satisfy now this condition, and that's what you get. Okay, and then you play the same game, and you end up with the fact that d i is proportional to d bar i is proportional to d bar the small d bar i, which is this determinant here of these these objects, and you must divide by the same minus one as before. So what you end up with is this formula, which is the same as before, except that there is gamma A here, which is this. Okay. And I think I can prove it rigorously here. I just gave you the heuristic argument, but you can just take uh, your Holton uh, Harris book and reproduce what they did for this, and it works also. It's a bit uh, long, but it works. So in the end, you make your by ratio of angle determinants, and you end up with these formulas. Okay, and that's for one parity, and for the other parity, you simply exchange uh, B to W, or the company change your colors, B, B, B and W, C, corresponding to C, was one plus C, gamma, <coughs> gamma, and then you express the three-point function, and you are done. 
So it, let me show you what it gives you for quad regulation, for instance. So it, these are faces with uh, degree four only, and I put away one for the faces because uh, uh, there's no need to put weights for, for faces in that case. If you know the number of vertices, you will have faces. So these equations, what they give you is this, which you can see, by the way, as a parameterization of T black and T white in terms of two quantities B and W. Okay. Now the C case we're given by this formula. So there are two alpha Qs which are non zero, which are alpha zero and alpha one. All the other ones are zero because of this constraint here. So there's just one C zero and one C one, which are given by this. The characteristic equation becomes this. Okay. Which again you can see as a parameterization now of B and W in terms of X, this X here, and this C, which is a ratio. So you have a parameterization of T black and T white in terms of C and X in the end. Okay? And that's your formula. So they are very simple formulas. Okay? And you have this gamma here, which is this. Okay? So that's what you would have for quad regulations. And you can use that to get expansions of B1, B2, B3, G of 1, G of 2, G of 3, as far as you want. I mean, as far as the computer can, can go. Okay? And that's, so that's finished for the, not for the talk, for, the, <coughs> for my uh, bivariate uh, two-point function. Okay? So I have time to discuss another bivariate two-point function, which is of interest. Which, now forget about black and white uh, of bicoloration. <coughs> you start with a quadrant with a. Uh, here I discuss only a quadrant, quad quadrangulation. So all the faces have to be four, <coughs> except the external face. Okay, so I start with a, rooted, a pointed rooted quadrangulation with a boundary of next two n, and I assign weights t, t circle or t bullet, converted according to whether or not they are local. Maximum for the distance to the pointed vertex. So I can take the pointed vertex, I can take the distance. Okay? And some of them are local maxima, meaning that all their neighbors are closer. This one is a local <coughs> maximum, this one is not a local maximum because it has a neighbor which is larger. Okay? So this kind of, of objects <coughs> were uh, first considered by uh, Ambiard and Bud in, uh, in, uh, and actually you will see why. Uh, so, and we call J of D the corresponding jet wave function where the distance here between uh, the root vertex here and the pointed vertex is less than D. And I call Gn of G N of zero. G N of G. Okay, so, so if I take this object, I, I can call the, I can apply the so called uh, ambient bird bijection by applying the ambient bird rules, which are the inverse of the Schaeffer's rule, which corresponds to do with each phase to look at the distance and to make these connections depending on whether the distance are of this type or this type around the face. So I do that for all the faces inside the formulation. And for the external face, I do the same. I look for, uh, except that I do it, uh, I, I mean I collect vertices which are followed. I only retain those vertices which are followed by a larger index. So this two is followed by a three, so I retain it. This two is followed by a four, sorry, by a three, so I retain it. This 3 I re is followed by a 4, so I retain it. This 4 is followed by a 3, so I don't retain it. And then I connect the vertices which have been retained. And I do that cyclically. Okay. For the external phase, you have to do that cyclically. Okay. So if you do that, in the end, what you end up with is the, so that's the result by uh, Ampion and Bird. You end up with a general, general map, routine map, where all, we, where, which all, where whose whole faces uh, uh, encircle one of the local maxima. So the local maxima inside each of the faces of this original map, and the length of the original map is, has been divided by two. And now I can use a standard bijection, which corresponds to put back, uh, and, and sorry, and the, and the, the, the local maxima gets disconnected, of course. Okay, we have to, to remove them. Now I re reboot them, but now I color them in white. Okay? And I use a standard equivalence between maps and quadrangulation, which now corresponds to take these black, these new white vertices and connect them to all the corners around the face, which I did here. Okay, and you end up with another quadrangulation, 
which has the same length, quadruple length, as the original one. So actually, you have a bijection between this quadrangulation and this quadrangulation. Okay, and here, except that here the uh, <coughs> here you the distance you I mean here is the distance that we change in a way we should not control. So you don't know what the, what the distance what happens to the distance. Except of course in t equals zero, meaning that this vertex was here, so t equals zero is still there. Okay? Therefore d equals zero is preserved. And therefore Jn is equal to Fn by so. So I know this J n because I know Fn by F. Okay? But now I can make a slice decomposition starting from the, from this map. From the original map, if I apply my same size decomposition, I use the usual one taking the leftmost shortest path. Okay? And it's going to decompose my object into slices. And actually, to do two, what I should do is consider two types of slices. So now, now there are no more black and white vertices, there are just vertices which may, might be local maxima or non local maxima. So in the slice, actually, I should look at the distance to the apex and put weights <coughs> T black or T white according to the whether this points or local maxima of the distance to the apex. So that's the correct thing to do. So all, none of these points is a, is a, is a local maximum because uh, this is a judge's pass. Again, I should not put weights to this on this side. And the only uh, uh, subtlety is that this vertex can be a local maximum or not within the slice. But then I must, dis I must consider two generating functions. One, the, nat the natural one in which I put a weight T black or T white according to whether or not it's a local maximum in the, in the, in the, in the slice. And one in which I put a weight T black uh, irrespectively of its, uh, whether it's or not it's a, it's a local maximum of the distance in the slice. So I have two generating functions. And if I know these generative functions, actually I can get, and that's a work by Ambion uh, and I can get the generative <coughs> function for planar maps with the weight T black per vertex and T white per face. So if now you look at the, make, as the what your slide decomposition tells you, what it tells you is that Jn has actually the sum of a path of length 2n with weights as again assigned to descending steps. But now the rule is that you must put away qj if the descending step follows an ascending step. <coughs> and if it follows the descending step, you should weight you should weight it by p. Okay? And then if you write this as a continued fraction, you get a new type of continued fraction. Okay? So it's the same object as before, but which I expressed before as a steel chest type continued fraction, and you get me the w and the, and, the, and the b. And here I express it in terms of this new type of continued fraction. This mean the Q and the P, okay, which are also of interest. So the Q and the P they satisfy uh, a nonlinear system of equation, which was uh, solved by Ambjorn and Bird, and this is the solution which looks very much like the expression I showed you for quadrangulation with, with the weights uh, assigned to the colors. Okay. And actually, instead of but that, that was a guess. That was guess. That was true, of course. But you have to guess it. Then you have to be clever enough. Uh, but there were smart people, so they guessed it. But uh, <coughs> now you can try to have a more uh, constructive approach, and that's uh, almost finished. So you can decide to use the theory of this new type of continued fraction here to extract the coefficients. So the theory you can find actually a nice paper by uh, Philip and uh, Milan. Okay, and uh, so and what they say is that this or again ratio of uncle type determinants of this type, this might this is might be wrong because there this is or should be by one if you more. I, I think they are correct, but I'm not completely sure. So if you look, don't use this uh, transparency without know, checking. The, the, but now you have uncle this uncle type determinants. They are of this type f n plus n minus i <coughs> minus two. So what is new is you require they require n f n for negative n. Uh, okay, it's not so nice. Okay. So in the case of finite continuous fraction, the f n for negative n are actually related to the f n bullets okay, for positive n. That's what uh, Minat and Philip showed. Okay. Because you want the, the continuous fraction to stop somewhere, then it, 
impose these conditions, and they have to <coughs> they are related, and therefore you know the effect from again to n, and therefore everything is fixed. But for infinite confinement fraction, you can you can actually take any fn for negative n and you get a solution. Okay? And the reason for that is that if I give you this equality, it doesn't fix all the coefficients of this continuous fraction, is that it's under determined. Okay, so there's some information missing. And the information missing is the Fn for n negative. Okay? So still you may decide to use the same relation as uh, for finite, <coughs> which relate uh, the Fn for n negative to the Fn bullet, sorry, for n positive. For why this choice, I don't know. But you can do that, and if you do that, you recover precisely on the bottom of the fungus. So there's something to understand there. And of course, not only you recover this formula, but when you apply it to maps with, uh, let's say, uh, examinations or whatever, you get the correct formula too, which was not known so far. But there is still one point missing: is why you should use uh, uh, this recipe to to to, to choose the uh, the effect for negative and plus one. black and white vertices uh, uh, strange so as to get to uh, so as to get a new limit but uh, probably you, maybe you can reach other limits by it. but this is kind of artificial to me I don't know I guess from yeah I mean from, from the point of view of the I mean when there are local maxima oh you have a good point who required a few local maxima that is kind of interesting then yes it is here. but I think you showed that basically there is there's a job. I, there's a gather you have a basically cause of objects or not, but there is no point. That's true. That is ju just uh, <coughs> two limits. Mm -hmm. Still might uh, get some explicit formulas. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't play with them. Maybe we, I, but, uh, maybe we can play with them and find something interesting. That's, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so there's what we got is actually uh, some uh, uh, family of intermediate continued fractions between that's the right. two you showed. Yes, that's a is, very good question. Is there any, any way one could assess yes, this? Yes, yes, yes. That's a very good question. So the, the, the two problems actually are... Okay, I use two bijections. The Arnold-Bell bijection, which uses the distance, <coughs> and the usual bijection, which uses this black and white uh, trick. Actually, they are exact. They are the same uh, type. I use the labeling. In one, in, which, in one case, it's the distance. In the other case, it's zero or one, which is the parity of the distance. In one case, I get this TGS type continuous fraction. In the other case, I get this new type of continuous fraction. But I can use actually any other function of the distance, which rather than parity, which is kind of trivial function, I can use other function of the distance which respect the parity, not the distance itself. I can use many different labelings which are related to the distance. And my guess is that it's going to give you the, 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 inter, this intermediate continuous fraction which you get, which are a mixture of stitches and this uh, Jacobi type. Yes, that's perfect here. But that's something I'm, I'm going to explore. Probably with you if you want. <laughs> if you're interested, I mean, it's your guess. When you go to 